Welcome to part five of the Unsolved Mysteries Iceberg, where we explore dark and fascinating mysteries. On this iceberg, we deep dive unsolved mysteries, including true crime, myths and legends, strange events, cryptids, urban legends, internet mysteries, and more. Now join me for a trip down the rabbit hole. The Disappearance of Tammy Lynn Leppert. Tammy Lynn Leppert was an American model and actress who disappeared in 1983. Born on February 5, 1965 in Rockledge, Florida, she began her career in beauty pageants, winning over hundreds of titles by her late teens. Transitioning to acting, she appeared in several films, including Scarface in 1983, where she played the woman who ended up distracting the lookouts during the infamous chainsaw scene. Leppert's life took a mysterious turn in 1983. Leading up to her disappearance, she exhibited erratic behavior, expressing fears for her safety and alluding to having witnessed something traumatic. This period of distress followed her participation in a weekend party, after which her behavior changed drastically. She became paranoid, refusing to eat or drink from open containers, fearing being poisoned. On the set of Scarface, she witnessed a scene where someone was shot and artificial blood squirted out, which caused her to have a breakdown and flee the set. She did not participate further in filming, though it's unclear to me if she was scheduled for any further scenes. On July 6, 1983, after a heated argument during a drive with a male friend, Leppert exited his car in Cocoa Beach, Florida, and was never seen again. She was 18 years old at the time. The argument, reportedly about her fears and behavior, was the last known interaction she had. Despite extensive searches and public appeals, no credible leads were found. Over the years, theories have surfaced, including connections to organized crime, the drug scene in Florida, and her alleged knowledge of illegal activities in Hollywood. Another theory is that she suffered a psychotic break and met her untimely end as a result of this break. Another theory, perhaps in conjunction with another one of the theories, is that genuinely fearing for her life and the safety of her family, she voluntarily disappeared and began a new life. This theory, of course, becomes less likely with each passing year. However, None of these theories have been substantiated with concrete evidence, and no trace of Tammy has ever been found. Sally McNelly and Shane Stewart The Sally McNelly and Shane Stewart case is a cold case stemming from events on July 4, 1988, in San Angelo, Texas. Sally McNelly, 18, and Shane Stewart, 17, disappeared after attending a 4th of July fireworks show their bodies were discovered months later, in November 1988, near Twin Buttes Reservoir, showing signs of gunshot wounds. The case remains unsolved till this day. However, unlike other cold cases, there are allegations of their involvement in a satanic cult. Throughout their relationship, it was reported by Sally's acquaintances that she and Shane participated in gatherings where occult practices and black magic were observed suggesting their involvement with a satanic cult. In March of 1988, the same year they disappeared, the couple handed a firearm to the local authorities, claiming it was given to them by a cult member who claimed it was used in a slaying. The police ran the serial number and found it was a stolen weapon. A person of interest was named in 2017, but as of 2024, he has not been arrested and no one has been charged in relation to the crime. Hypothesizing about the fate of Sally McNelly and Shane Stewart, and considering the context and clues surrounding their disappearance and ending, suggests a number of plausible scenarios. Their involvement with or knowledge of a satanic cult, as indicated by their actions and the statements they made to friends and police, could have placed them in a dangerous position. The couple's decision to return a gun they claimed was used in a crime by cult members to the police could have marked them as threats to the secrecy of the cult's activities. 
Further, even if the weapon wasn't associated with quote-unquote cult activities, turning it over may still have angered the wrong person. Also, it's plausible that their known association with such a group and their subsequent actions led to them being targeted to prevent any further exposure of the cult's activities or to serve as a warning to others within the group against betrayal. That said, their slayings don't seem to have a particularly ritualistic element, and I would suspect members of a satanic cult committing such a heinous act would do so in a ritualistic way. Given the lack of concrete evidence and the myriad of unanswered questions, it's also possible that their involvement with the cult has been overstated or misinterpreted. They may have just upset the wrong person at the 4th of July celebrations, leading to their fates. Indrid Cold Indrid Cold, also known as the Smiling Man, is a figure associated with UFO and paranormal phenomena, first reported in the 1960s in West Virginia. The most notable encounter with Indrid Cold occurred on November 2, 1966, when a salesman named Woodrow Derenberger claimed to have met him on Interstate 77 near Parkersburg, West Virginia. According to Derenberger, Cold emerged from a UFO-like craft that landed on the highway in front of his vehicle. Cold was described as a humanoid male with dark hair, over six feet tall, and wearing a reflective metallic outfit. He communicated telepathically. His mouth did not move, yet Derenberger heard him as if through spoken word. Cold introduced himself and asked questions about the area, expressing curiosity about Earth's environment and humanity. After the encounter, Derenberger reported ongoing communications with Cold, detailing these experiences in a book titled Visitors from Lanulos, Co-written with Harold W. Hubbard, Derenberger claimed Cold was from a planet called Lanulos, near the galaxy of Genomedes. Following Derenberger's initial report, other sightings and communications with beings claiming to be Indrid Cold or associated entities were reported across the United States. These encounters often shared similar characteristics. Communication through telepathy, descriptions of cold as friendly or benign, and discussions that suggested an extraterrestrial interest in Earth and its people. Critics and skeptics questioned the validity of Derenberger's experiences, pointing to the lack of physical evidence and the fantastical nature of his claims. Some suggest that the cold encounters were hoaxes, delusions, or misinterpretations of mundane experiences. However, Believers in the paranormal or extraterrestrial life cite the consistency in descriptions of cold and the sincerity of Derenberger and other witnesses as reasons to consider the encounters as genuine unexplained phenomena. Indrid Cold's story intersects with the broader context of the 1960s, a period marked by a surge in UFO sightings and an increasing public interest in extraterrestrial life. The Mothman prophecies, a book by John Keel published in 1975, later adapted into a film in 2002, further popularized the story of Indrid Cold. Keel connected Cold with the Mothman sightings in Point Pleasant, West Virginia, suggesting a link between different paranormal phenomena. Although critics say that Keel's work is speculative and blends various unverified accounts, it has played a significant role in cementing the legend of Indrid Cold in the cultural imagination. I note that accounts of Indrid Cold seem to have become very popular in the last decade or so, likely due to the character being an easy, creepy stock character to fit in a creepy pasta type story. Bella Kiss. Bella Kiss was a Hungarian serial slayer, born in 1877, who gained notoriety for the gruesome discovery of over 20 bodies hidden in metal drums on his property in a suburb of Budapest after his disappearance in 1916. Before his crimes came to light, Kiss lived as a tinsmith, presenting himself as a respectable, though solitary figure in the community. Kiss began placing advertisements in newspapers, seeking lonely women seeking a fortune teller. 
Corresponding with numerous women, he lured them to his home under the guise of marriage advice or financial assistance. It is during this period that he committed his slayings by deceiving and then ending his victims, whose bodies he preserved in alcohol within sealed metal drums stored on his property. Kiss was called up for service in World War I in 1914. In 1916, during a planned renovation of Bella Kiss's rented property, the landlord discovered seven sealed tin drums containing the bodies of female victims, initiating a horrifying investigation. Kiss, having joined the war effort in 1914, was absent, leading to speculation about his whereabouts. The landlord informed the authorities who discovered a total of 24 bodies at Kiss's residence, revealing a gruesome pattern of behavior. Investigators discovered books on poisons and strangulation, along with the victims' bodies preserved in alcohol and drained of blood, suggesting that Kiss might have practiced vampirism. Efforts to capture Kiss were complicated by his apparently common name and the uncertainty of his status as possibly deceased or a prisoner of war. Over the years, there were numerous sightings of him across the world, including in the Turkish army, in France, in Serbia, and in New York City, but none were confirmed. The Hungarian police and later law enforcement officials in various jurisdictions pursued leads without success. The mystery of his final whereabouts and fate remains unsolved, adding to the infamy of his crimes. My hypothesis on this one is that Bella Kiss likely saw or heard of a newspaper report describing his crimes while he was on the front, and deserted at that point, leaving behind his old identity. Supporting this hypothesis, an individual in the French Foreign Legion was identified as potentially being Bella Kiss. However, this individual deserted the Legion prior to investigation and was never found. Alternatively, two years passed between Bela Kiss's enlistment in the Austro-Hungarian army and the finding of the corpses. These were, to put it mildly, not easy years to be on the front, and it's very possible that he perished on the field of battle, contracted a fatal disease, or died in a prisoner of war camp. The Beast of Givodan. The Beast of Givodan refers to a series of violent attacks on humans between 1764 and 1767 in southern France. Over 100 deaths were attributed to the beast. In the mid 18th century, Givodan was a remote, rugged area. The attacks began in June 1764 when a young woman reported being attacked by a beast she described as looking like a wolf, yet not a wolf. The first recorded fatality occurred shortly after. Reports described the beast as having formidable teeth and immense tail, with red and black fur. The series of attacks created widespread panic. Victims were often killed by throat bites, and some reports suggested the beast displayed unusual behavior, not typical of wolves. King Louis XV took a personal interest in the attacks sending professional wolf hunters, soldiers, and volunteers to hunt down the beast. Despite extensive hunts, rewards, and the deployment of hundreds of men, the attacks continued. In 1765, Jean-Charles Marc Antoine Vomesle Deneval, a famous wolf hunter, was appointed to kill the beast. He brought with him eight bloodhounds, specially trained in wolf hunting. Also, what a ridiculously cool name. I hope I pronounced that one somewhat correct. Despite killing several large and threatening wolves, the attacks did not stop. Later, the king sent Lieutenant of the Hunt, Francois Antoine, who also had little initial success. However, in September 1765, Antoine killed a large gray wolf, suspected to be responsible for the attacks. It was sent to Versailles and officially declared as the beast. Yet, the attacks continued after its death, disproving this claim. The attacks decreased and eventually stopped by June 1767. The last known attack was linked to a large wolf, shot by a local hunter. Speculations about the beast's identity include a wolf, a hyena, 
a lion, a prehistoric animal, or a human killer using a pack of trained wolf-dog hybrids. The latter theory also suggests that the creature or creatures may have been armored war dogs or armored wolf-dog hybrids. However, the lack of concrete evidence and the sensational nature of eyewitness accounts make it difficult to ascertain the beast's true identity. The Death of Sonny Liston Sonny Liston, the heavyweight boxing champion renowned for his fights with Muhammad Ali, was found dead under mysterious circumstances in his Las Vegas home in January 1971. Officially, the cause of death was listed as heart failure, but suspicions and theories abound, pointing to foul play. Liston's career was shadowed by allegations of connections to the mob, a troubled personal life, and controversies inside and outside the ring. His rise to fame was as dramatic as his fall, with these alleged ties to organized crime that reportedly influenced his boxing career. The discovery of Liston's body, decomposed, suggested he had been dead for several days before being found. The initial cause of death pointed to natural causes. However, several inconsistencies and questions emerged. One theory suggests Liston's death was due to an overdose of an intravenous drug either accidentally or deliberately. Friends and family contested the idea that Liston was a drug user, raising doubts about an accidental overdose. Further, his trainer and his wife confirmed that he was deathly afraid of needles. His trainer in particular confirmed that Liston had to cancel a lucrative African tour due to a refusal to get shots. Another theory implicates the mob, Given Liston's alleged associations and debts to organized crime figures, some speculate his death was a professional job ordered by the mob, possibly due to these debts, or for trying to distance himself from their influence. This theory is supported by Liston's fear for his life in the months leading up to his death, as reported by those close to him. The final theory is that he was supposed to take a fall in a fight six months prior to his demise. He didn't do so, and under this theory, cost underworld figures significant sums of money, leading to a contract being taken out on him. Fresno Nightcrawlers The Fresno Nightcrawlers are cryptids that have gained attention primarily through video footage showing small, white, bipedal figures in Fresno, California. These entities appear to be relatively short, with most of their height attributed to their legs possessing a small or non-existent torso and no discernible arms. The first known footage of these creatures dates back to the 2010, captured by a Fresno resident who was alerted by his dogs barking at night. Upon reviewing the security tapes, the homeowner observed two strange figures moving across his lawn. The figures were described as having a smooth, white surface, with the larger one being approximately four feet in height and the smaller one around three feet. The video was later aired on a local TV station, sparking public interest. A second significant piece of evidence came from Yosemite National Park, located several hours north of Fresno. This footage showed creatures resembling the original Fresno Nightcrawlers, further fueling speculation and debate about their existence and nature. As you can see, the Yosemite footage is particularly haunting. Note the uncanny movements of these potential creatures. Various theories have been proposed regarding the nature of the Fresno Nightcrawlers. Some suggest they are extraterrestrial beings, given their non-human appearance and movement. Others propose they could be a new species, paranormal entities, or even elaborate hoaxes. Some have also proposed that they could be figures from Native American lore. I have no strong opinion on what these creatures are, but I would love to find out. If anyone has a good theory on the Fresno Nightcrawlers, let me know in the comments below. Alien Big Cats Alien Big Cats, also known as ABCs or Phantom Cats, refer to sightings of large, non-native felids in environments outside their indigenous range. These reports come from various parts of the world, 
including the United Kingdom, Australia, and the United States. Alien big cats often resemble panthers, cougars, or leopards, animals not typically found in these locations. The origin of alien big cat sightings can be traced back to various factors. One explanation suggests that some of these animals were once pets or part of private collections and were intentionally released into the wild by their owners. Another factor contributing to the alien big cats phenomenon is the escape of animals from zoos, circuses, or private collections. A famous example was a mountain lion, native to North America, discovered in Scotland in 1980. I note that sightings of big cats such as lions or tigers appear to be rare, with smaller big cats seeming to make up the vast majority of the sightings. Ball lightning. Ball lightning is a rare and unexplained atmospheric phenomenon that appears as luminous, spherical lighting balls, which can vary in size from smaller than a pea to several meters in diameter. Unlike the common linear lightning bolt, ball lightning is reported to last longer, sometimes up to several seconds, and can move, including hovering in the air or bouncing along the ground. It often appears during thunderstorms, but has also been reported in clear weather. Descriptions of its color vary, with reports of orange, yellow, blue, and even white orbs. The cause of ball lightning remains a topic of debate among scientists, with several theories proposed but no definitive explanation. One theory suggests it's a form of plasma, where gases in the air ionize to create a glowing ball. Another theory proposes that ball lightning is the result of silicon vaporizing from the soil when regular lightning strikes the earth. The vapor could then condense into a fine dust, which becomes electrified and glows, forming ball lightning. Another theory suggests that ball lightning is a collective epileptic seizure caused by a rapidly changing magnetic field. Of course, this does not account for ball lightning events caught on camera. There are myriad theories on the cause of ball lightning. The only thing scientists appear to be able to agree upon is that it is most definitely a real phenomenon. Personally, I've always wanted to see ball lightning, but as yet I haven't had the opportunity. If you've had experiences with ball lightning, I would really appreciate if you would write out your account of the event in the comments below. Seriously, I love a good ball lightning encounter. The Smiley Face Killer The Smiley Face Killer theory suggests that a series of unsolved deaths of young men across the United States, primarily from the late 1990s to the 2010s, are not accidental drownings or consensual endings, but the actions of one or more serial slayers. This theory is named for the Smiley Face Graffiti, found near some locations where victims' bodies were found, hinting at a potential signature. Victims fitting a specific profile, young, white, athletic, and outwardly successful men last seen leaving parties or bars, were found dead in water, sometimes weeks after disappearing. These incidents span multiple states, including Minnesota, Wisconsin, New York, and Ohio, suggesting a pattern that some believe points to a serial killer. However, the theory is not widely accepted and faces significant skepticism. Critics point out the lack of direct evidence linking the deaths to a criminal, suggesting the graffiti's commonality makes it coincidental. They argue that the statistical likelihood of such accidents among the demographic of young men drinking is not unusual and does not necessarily indicate a serial killer's involvement. Accusations of confirmation bias have been leveled at the theory's proponents, who are seen as focusing only on evidence that supports their hypothesis. Law enforcement agencies, including the FBI, have found insufficient evidence to support the theory, maintaining that these are unrelated incidents. The Disappearance of Brian Schaffer Brian Schaffer, a 27-year-old medical student at Ohio State University, vanished on April 1st, 2006. 
The mysterious circumstances have captivated the public since. On the night of his disappearance, Schaffer went out to celebrate the beginning of spring break with friends, visiting the ugly Tuna Saluna, a bar in Columbus, Ohio. Despite extensive review of surveillance footage from the area, Brian was seen entering the bar, but never seen leaving. The night began with Schaffer and a friend embarking on a bar crawl, ultimately ending up at the ugly Tuna Saluna. Surveillance cameras captured Brian outside the bar around 2 a.m., talking briefly with two women before re-entering the venue. This is the last confirmed sighting of Schaffer. Notably, all other patrons were accounted for on the surveillance footage, leaving or entering the bar, except for Brian. This discrepancy has fueled theories ranging from a possible hidden exit to foul play inside the bar. Despite exhaustive searches and public appeals for information, no significant leads have emerged. Brian's cell phone, credit cards, and bank accounts have shown no activity since the night he disappeared. The lack of evidence or clues as to his whereabouts has made this case particularly baffling. Adding to the mystery, Schaffer's girlfriend continued to call him every night for months after his disappearance, and the phone always went to voicemail. However, on one occasion, the call rang three times, rather than going to voicemail. No satisfactory explanation was ever provided for this, other than the fact that it may have been a glitch. Also, some speculate that he may have been slain by the smiley face perpetrator discussed in the previous entry. That said, there's no evidence whatsoever to suggest this. Importantly, police are still actively investigating the case and have a series of theories which they believe to be credible. However, the police have not discussed these theories with the public so as to maintain the integrity of the investigation. Personally, I really hope Brian Schaffer is still alive and that he disguised himself in the ugly Tuna Saluna before exiting and making his escape. Perhaps he realized that medical school wasn't for him and he felt that he was too deep in debt to back out and left to start a new life. That said, I have no evidence to support this and it's pure conjecture on my part. But hey, you knew you were going to get some conjecture when you clicked on an Unsolved Mysteries Iceberg video, didn't you? Okay, let me take a quick moment here to plug my channel. So you've made it this far. Take a quick moment to hit the like button, the subscribe button, and that notification bell. I really appreciate it, and it helps my channel grow, and helps me devote more time to content creation. Also, the Lazy Chill Zone Discord community is always growing, so hit the link in the description to join up. Also calling all chads and chadettes, join up on the Patreon or the YouTube membership. Both links are in the description. Now back to our iceberg. The Bosnian pyramid claims revolve around a series of structures near Visoko, Bosnia and Herzegovina, which some believe to be ancient man-made pyramids. The primary structure, dubbed the Bosnian Pyramid of the Sun, along with others labeled as the Pyramid of the Moon, Dragon, Earth, and Love, have been the center of controversy since their introduction by Samir Osmanagic in 2005. Osmanagic asserts that these are the oldest and largest pyramids on Earth, suggesting a date of construction around 12,000 years ago. This would significantly precede known ancient civilizations capable of such feats. Critics, including archaeologists and geologists, argue that the hills are natural formations known as flat irons, and that there's no evidence to support the claim of them being constructed pyramids. Despite this, Osmanagic and his supporters have undertaken excavations at the site, claiming to find man-made tunnels, stone blocks, and ancient writing, although these findings have not been validated by independent experts or recognized archaeological institutions. The geological composition of the hills matches that of natural sedimentary rocks with layers formed horizontally. Second, the lack of any documented tools, artifacts, or remnants of a civilization 
capable of building such structures raises significant doubts about the man-made hypothesis. Despite skepticism from the scientific community, the pyramid claims have boosted tourism in Visoko, with visitors coming to see the sites and participate in related activities. Osmanagic has also established a foundation to support ongoing research and excavation efforts, further promoting the idea of the Bosnian pyramids as a significant archaeological and historical discovery. Personally, I just don't see anything here. There's no evidence that these hills are pyramids whatsoever, and a ton of evidence that they're just normal hills. Sometimes a slightly weird looking hill is still just a hill. The Tegan Incident Sadamichi Hirasawa, a Japanese painter turned notorious criminal, became infamous for his role in the Tegan Incident, one of Japan's most well-known criminal cases. On January 26, 1948, in Tokyo's Shinamachi District, a man posing as a public health official entered a branch of Teikoku Bank, also known as Tegan for short. Claiming to be dispatched by U.S. occupation authorities to inoculate bank employees against a dysentery outbreak, he duped 16 bank employees and family members into drinking a solution purported to be a vaccine. The solution, however, was laced with cyanide, leading to the deaths of 12 individuals, with four survivors suffering severe poisoning effects. The perpetrator left with a very small amount of cash, suggesting robbery was not the motivation for this heinous act. Sadamichi Hirasawa, a relatively unknown painter, became a prime suspect months later, largely due to his supposed connection to the poison used in the crime. Hirasawa's arrest was precipitated by his own actions. He had written a series of suspicious checks, which drew police attention. Further investigation revealed Hirasawa's interest in chemicals, specifically poisons, which he claimed was for his art. His detailed knowledge about cyanide and inconsistent alibis led to his arrest for the slayings. Further yet, he possessed a similar amount in cash to the money stolen. I suppose the serial numbers of the money weren't known, but if they were, presumably these could have been used to determine if the cash he possessed was the stolen cash. Hirasawa went on trial. He maintained his innocence throughout, claiming he was framed and that his confessions were coerced through torture and intimidation, a claim supported by some human rights groups and legal experts. Despite the lack of physical evidence directly linking Hirasawa to the crime scene and the deaths, he was convicted solely based on circumstantial evidence and his confessions. The trial highlighted the reliance on confessions in the Japanese legal system, raising questions about the fairness of such practices. I note that this emphasis on confessions is strongly present in all legal systems influenced by the Confucian tradition, such as Japan's. The verdict was a death sentence, but Hirasawa would never face this penalty. To complete the process, the Minister of Justice would need to sign the warrant to complete the act. However, this was never done. Doubts about his guilt and the trial's fairness led to numerous appeals and retrials. However, all appeals were ultimately rejected and Hirasawa remained on death row until his death from natural causes in 1987 at the age of 95. The case remains one of Japan's most enduring mysteries, with Hirasawa's guilt still questioned by many. The Axeman of New Orleans the Axeman of New Orleans was a serial slayer who terrorized the city between 1918 and 1919. The individual's identity remains unknown to this day. The spree began on May 23, 1918, when Joseph and Catherine Maggio were brutally slain in their home. The killer used their own axe, which he left at the scene, marking the beginning of a series of similar attacks. Over the next year, several more attacks occurred, some victims survived, while others did not. One of the most peculiar aspects of the case was a letter purportedly from the Axeman, published in a local newspaper on March 13, 1919. The letter, purportedly sent from hell, stated that the Axeman would kill again at 15 minutes past midnight on March 19th, 
but would spare the occupants of any place where a jazz band was playing. That night, jazz music filled the air of New Orleans as residents sought to avoid becoming the next victims. The Axemen's attacks were characterized by the use of an axe or razor, often belonging to the victims themselves, and the removal of panels or doors to gain entry into the homes, indicating premeditation. Despite the intense fear and significant police efforts, the Axeman was never caught or identified, and the slaying ceased as mysteriously as they had begun. Several theories have been proposed regarding the Axeman's identity and motives. One theory suggests the activities were the work of a mafia professional, given the targeting of Italian Americans, which some speculated could have been warnings or punishments. Another theory posits that the Axeman was mentally ill, possibly believing himself to be a supernatural entity, which could explain the bizarre letter to the press and the seemingly random selection of victims. Some have speculated that the Axeman might have been a sadistic individual who enjoyed the fear and notoriety his crimes generated, seeing the city's reaction to his letter as a form of manipulation and control. There's also a theory that the slayings were not the work of one person, but several individuals with similar methods, possibly inspired by the initial crimes or using the Axeman's MO to cover their unrelated slayings. Investigative efforts at the time were hampered by the lack of forensic technology and the chaotic nature of crime scene investigations, which often led to contaminated evidence and conflicting eyewitness accounts. The intense media coverage and public hysteria also contributed to a circus-like atmosphere around the case, making it difficult for law enforcement to sift through rumors and sensationalized reports to find actionable leads. Mohammed XII of Granada. Mohammed XII, also known as Boabdil, was the last Nasrid ruler of the Emirate of Granada in Spain. His reign ended when Granada capitulated to the Catholic monarchs, Ferdinand II of Aragon and Isabella I of Castile in 1492, marking the conclusion of the Reconquista. Following his surrender, Mohammed was exiled and eventually settled in North Africa. The exact location of Muhammad's final resting place remains uncertain, with historical sources providing conflicting information. However, it is widely believed that he spent his last years in the region near the Algerian city of Tlemcen. Some accounts suggest that he died there and was buried in the city or its surroundings. Other sources suggest that he was buried in a tomb located in Fez, in Morocco. Despite this, the precise location of his grave has not been identified, and no monument or memorial exists to mark his burial site conclusively. The Kaz-2 Incident The Kaz-2 disappearance, also known as the Ghost Yacht, is a maritime mystery that occurred in April 2007. The Kaz-2, a 30-foot catamaran, was found adrift off the coast of Australia with its three crew members, Derek Batten, 56, Peter Tunstead, 69, and James Tunstead, 63, missing. Despite extensive searches, they were never found, leading to widespread speculation about their fate. The yacht embarked from Airlie Beach, Queensland, on April 15, 2007, heading for Townsville, Queensland, as part of a longer voyage to Western Australia. The last known contact with the crew was on April 15th. On April 18th, the Kaz-2 was spotted adrift by a helicopter, but initial observation efforts were hampered by bad weather. It was not until April 20th that authorities boarded the seemingly deserted yacht, approximately 160 kilometers east of Townsville. The scene aboard the Kaz-2 was puzzling. The yacht was in good condition with its engine running, a laptop turned on, a full table of food and utensils set out, and personal belongings in place. The only signs of anything amiss were a small tear in the mainsail and a missing dinghy, later found deflated and partially submerged near the yacht. Investigations did not indicate foul play or a struggle on board, 
The weather report showed conditions were relatively calm during the crew's disappearance. The official coroner's report, released in 2008, concluded that the men likely fell overboard in an accident and drowned. The report suggested that one crew member might have fallen into the water while attempting to free a fishing line or during a mishap with the yacht's small dinghy, with the others subsequently falling in while trying to rescue him. The yacht, left on autopilot, continued on its course, leaving no chance for the men to get back on board. No evidence of deliberate disappearance or any form of misconduct has ever been found. Another popular theory is that the men were swept away by a rogue wave. However, there's no evidence for this. The Roswell Incident The Roswell Crash refers to an event that took place in July 1947 near Roswell, New Mexico, where an unidentified flying object reportedly crashed on a ranch. The U.S. military initially announced they had recovered a flying disc, but this statement was quickly retracted, claiming it was merely a weather balloon. Over the years, this incident has fueled widespread speculation and theories about UFOs and extraterrestrial life, becoming a cornerstone of UFO lore. On July 8, 1947, Roswell Army Airfield issued a press release stating they had recovered a flying disc from a ranch near Roswell. The story made headlines, sparking immediate public interest. However, the excitement was short-lived. The next day, Brigadier General Roger Ramey, commander of the 8th Air Force, held a press conference in Fort Worth, Texas, where debris from the crash was presented as a weather balloon with a radar reflector, debunking the initial flying disc claim. In the 1990s, the U.S. government disclosed that the debris found was part of Project Mogul, a top-secret military project aimed at detecting Soviet atomic bomb tests. The project involved high-altitude balloons equipped with microphones to capture sound waves generated by explosions, apparently explaining the unusual materials found at the crash site. This unusual revelation was intended to close the case on the Roswell incident, but it only fueled further speculation. There are numerous competing theories as to what happened at Roswell. However, I'll stick to the two most credible here, since the Roswell incident is a massive rabbit hole in and of itself. One of the most popular theories is that the object that crashed was an alien spacecraft, and the bodies of extraterrestrials were recovered from the wreckage. This theory was bolstered by various witnesses and insiders who came forward over the years with stories of recovered alien bodies and advanced technology. Proponents argue that the military's quick retraction of the initial flying disc statement and subsequent secrecy surrounding the incident are evidence of a cover-up. Another theory suggests that the crashed object was a secret military test craft, possibly part of Project Mogul or another classified project. Advocates of this theory point to the era's intense research into advanced aviation technology, including experimental aircraft and balloons for espionage or nuclear monitoring. They argue that the military's secrecy and the later explanation of Project Mogul are consistent with practices of protecting classified projects. The only thing that can be said with certain about the Roswell crash is that something did indeed crash and there was a subsequent government cover-up. The Baltic Sea Anomaly The Baltic Sea Anomaly refers to a mysterious object discovered at the bottom of the Baltic Sea in 2011 by a Swedish treasure hunting team, Ocean X. The object, resembling a massive, flattened dome sitting atop a pillar, including features that look like ramps, stairways, and other structures not typically found in natural geological formations sparked global interest and speculation about its origins. The discovery occurred on June 19, 2011, when sonar scans revealed an unusual 60-meter diameter circular formation resting at a depth of about 90 meters. The images showed a structure with apparent hard angles and symmetries uncommon in natural objects leading to a flurry of theories about its origin. Suggestions ranged from a sunken UFO, an ancient monument, to 
to remnants of a prehistoric civilization. Ocean X's initial descriptions and released sonar images fueled speculation, with comparisons made to the fictional Millennium Falcon spacecraft from Star Wars. The team reported equipment malfunctions when near the anomaly, adding to the mystery and speculation about electromagnetic interference, further suggesting non-natural origins. Subsequent expeditions to the site attempted to clarify the nature of the object. Divers and remote-controlled submarines took samples and photographs. These investigations revealed that the anomaly sits on a rock formation covered in silt. The structure itself is composed of a type of basalt rock. Samples indicated no materials that would suggest an extraterrestrial or artificial origin. The supposed runways and stairs appear to be natural geological formations, possibly shaped by glacial and post-glacial processes. Scientific analysis leans towards the anomaly being a natural feature. Geologists suggest it might be a glacial deposit left behind by retreating glaciers from the last ice age. In 2019, an individual associated with Ocean X indicated there was the possibility of a further expedition to the site of the anomaly. However, as of 2024, this has yet to happen, and there have been no further updates. Personally, I'm skeptical about the Baltic Sea Anomaly's more fantastical origins, and had it been truly extraordinary, there would have been extensive, global scientific investigation. The lack of ongoing serious research from the scientific community suggests it's likely a natural formation, not the sensational discovery some have speculated. Also, the team behind the Baltic Sea Anomaly appears to have been very interested in a television show around the undersea feature, suggesting a financial motive to make the anomaly appear more mysterious than it actually is. That said, of course, a financial motive does not automatically discredit anything. Cleveland Torso Slayer The Cleveland Torso Slayer was a notorious serial killer who terrorized Cleveland, Ohio during the 1930s. Also known as the Mad Butcher of Kingsbury Run, the killer targeted marginalized individuals, leaving behind a trail too gruesome to discuss in this forum. Between 1935 and 1938, the killer claimed at least 13 victims, although the actual number may be higher. The victims, mostly drifters and transient individuals, were slain in such a way so as to meticulously remove any identifying features, leaving behind only torso remains. The activities occurred in the impoverished area of Kingsbury Run, known for its shanty towns and transient population. The killer operated with impunity, taking advantage of the transient nature of the area's inhabitants. The investigation into the crime spree faced significant issues, Limited forensic technology and the killer's meticulous methods hindered progress. Additionally, the transient nature of the victims made it difficult to establish connections or motives. Elliot Ness, famous for his role in bringing down Al Capone during Prohibition, also played a significant role in the case. In 1935, Ness was appointed as Cleveland's public safety director, tasked with cleaning up the city's corrupt police force and tackling organized crime. With the serial killer terrorizing Cleveland, Ness took personal interest in the case, viewing it as an opportunity to showcase his law enforcement prowess. However, even Ness, the famed lawman, was unable to make any meaningful progress into the case, and his inability to solve the case has made this case all the more mysterious. The torso slaying sparked widespread fear and speculation. Rumors of a deranged butcher preying on the vulnerable fueled public hysteria. Residents of Kingsbury Run lived in constant fear, wary of becoming the next victim of the elusive killer. The investigation received national attention, with newspapers sensationalizing the case and speculating on the killer's motives. However, the sensationalism did little to aid the investigation, and the killer continued to evade capture. In 1938, 
the torso slayings abruptly ceased, leaving behind a legacy of fear and unanswered questions. The killer's identity remains one of the greatest unsolved mysteries in American criminal history. The investigation produced several suspects over the years, but none were definitively linked to the crimes. One of the most notorious suspects was Dr. Francis E. Sweeney, a physician with a troubled past who had been discharged from the military for mental instability. Sweeney had a connection to one of the victims and reportedly confessed to the slayings while institutionalized, but his confession was deemed unreliable due to his mental state. Adding to the confusion, Dr. Sweeney was a close relative of one of Elliot Ness's political opponents, and there is a speculation that Ness's focus on Dr. Sweeney may have had political undertones. Another suspect was Frank Dolezal, a bricklayer with a history of violence who was arrested for assaulting a woman in Kingsbury Run. Dolezal had a violent temper and was known to frequent the area where many of the bodies were found, leading some to suspect him of involvement. However, no concrete evidence was ever found to link him to the crimes. There's also the theory that the slayings were not the work of a single person. The copycat theory posits that the killings may not have been the work of a single serial killer, but rather multiple individuals inspired by the initial crimes. This perspective suggests that after the first few crimes garnered significant attention, others may have committed similar crimes, potentially using the initial cases as cover for their own crimes. The Tokyo Metropolitan Slayings This unsolved mystery, known as the Tokyo Metropolitan Slayings, involves the deaths of 10 individuals across Chiba, Saitama, and Tokyo between 1968 and 1974. The perpetrator's method was brutal, attacking women who lived alone, committing unspeakable assaults, then slaying them at midnight before disposing of their bodies in a graphic manner. The case took a significant turn on September 12, 1974, when Etsuo Ono, a 37-year-old construction worker with a history of criminal activities, was arrested under suspicion of theft. His past, filled with stints in prison for theft, burglary, grievous bodily harm, and arson, which in the eyes of the Tokyo police made him a prime suspect in the slayings. Ono had previously attempted to violate a woman in Tokyo, had a blood type matching the perpetrator, and was familiar with the areas where the crimes occurred. He had weak alibis, and his history of using ladders for crimes paralleled the perpetrator's methods, leading the media to prematurely brand him the killer. Ono was allegedly tortured into signing a confession and was convicted of all 10 slayings. Initially convicted and sentenced to life in 1986, Ono's case was revisited on appeal in 1991. Doubts about his confession and the lack of solid evidence led to his acquittal. Once released, Ono was celebrated nationwide as a wrongfully accused man who fought for his freedom, and presumably after this 20-year ordeal, he was on the straight and narrow, right? But wait, there's more. In 1996, Ono ended a woman's life and disposed of her body in the same manner as the Tokyo Metropolitan Killer did, strongly calling into question whether he had been the perpetrator all along. To me, Ono's involvement in the Tokyo Metropolitan slayings seems plausible due to several compelling reasons. His criminal background, characterized by a pattern of violent and invasive behavior, aligns with the modus operandi of the slayings. Ono's history of burglary, S.A., and arson demonstrates a predisposition to the types of crimes associated with the slayings. His blood type, O negative, matches the presumed blood type of the killer, a rare characteristic that further narrows the suspect pool. Further, he committed a virtually identical slaying after his release from prison, for which he was convicted. Victorio Peak Treasure. The Victorio Peak Treasure is a legendary trove rumored to be hidden inside Victorio Peak in what is now White Sands Missile Range, New Mexico. Stories of gold and other valuables buried or concealed within the peak 
have circulated since the 1930s, sparking interest, controversy, and numerous expeditions. Yet the treasure, if it exists, remains elusive. The tale begins in 1937, when a man named Milton Doc Noss went hunting on Victorio Peak and stumbled upon a hidden entrance leading to a complex of tunnels and rooms. Inside, Noss claimed to find a vast quantity of gold bars, coins, jewels, and historical artifacts. According to Noss, the treasure was part of a larger cache accumulated by a Mexican general in the 19th century, hidden away in the peak's caverns. Others have suggested that the treasure is associated with Emperor Maximilian of Mexico, the Austrian duke who was placed on the Mexican throne through from 1864 to 1867. Intent on capitalizing on his find, Noss began extracting gold bars, planning to sell them. However, his efforts were marked by secrecy and suspicion. In 1939, in an attempt to enlarge the entrance to the cave for easier access to the treasure, an explosion collapsed the entrance, reportedly sealing the treasure inside. In 1949, Noss was killed by an associate in a dispute over the treasure. Interest in the Victorio Peak treasure surged again in the 1950s when the U.S. government expanded the White Sands Missile Range, encompassing Victorio Peak and restricting access. The Noss family and other claimants argued for the right to search for the treasure, leading to a series of government-sanctioned expeditions from the 1960s to the 1990s. These expeditions, despite extensive efforts and the use of modern technology, failed to uncover substantial evidence of the treasure's existence. Skeptics argue that the Victorio Peak treasure is a myth, suggesting Noss exaggerated or fabricated his discovery for fame or financial gain. Others believe the treasure was real but was removed or hidden elsewhere, possibly by government intervention. The lack of concrete evidence and the now restricted access to Victorio Peak have fueled speculation and conspiracy theories. Given that the U.S. Army has granted special access to the family and others to search for the treasure after the site was incorporated into the White Sands Missile Range test site, I have to believe there must be significant evidence to suggest this treasure is more fact than fiction. The Idol Warriors, Lee Harvey Oswald. The Idol Warriors is a novel written by Kerry Thornley that holds the unique distinction of being about Lee Harvey Oswald before the assassination of President John F. Kennedy in 1963. Thornley, who served alongside Oswald in the Marine Corps in the late 1950s, based the protagonist of his book on Oswald, drawing from his personal observations and interactions with him. Written and completed before the assassination, the novel offers an unintended pre-assassination psychological portrait of Oswald. Thornley began working on the Idol Warriors during a period when Oswald had defected to the Soviet Union, a move that intrigued and puzzled many, including Thornley. The book explores themes of disillusionment with the U.S. government and military, as well as the protagonist's defection to a foreign nation, mirroring Oswald's real-life actions. Although the novel is a work of fiction, its characters' experiences and sentiments were directly inspired by Oswald's behavior and ideologies, as perceived by Thornley. The manuscript gained notoriety after Kennedy's assassination, due to its author's direct connection to Oswald and the coincidental pre-assassination creation. Despite this intrigue, The Idol Warriors was never published during Thornley's lifetime as the Warren Commission subpoenaed and held the manuscript. The book itself was not published until 1991. Due to his writing about Oswald prior to the assassination, the Warren Commission, which examined the JFK incident, called upon him to testify. Oh, and Thornley also founded Discordianism, which is either considered a parody of religion or a legitimate religious belief system based upon chaos. Yeah, sometimes truth is stranger than fiction. 
time dilation and alien visitation. Alien beings traveling across the universe within their lifetime is theoretically possible due to time dilation, a consequence of Einstein's theory of relativity. As a spaceship accelerates to near light speeds, time on board slows relative to their home planet. This means while only a few years or less pass for the travelers, billions of years can pass on their home planet or at their destination. With advanced propulsion systems and life support technology, alien life forms could embark on interstellar journeys, experiencing distant worlds firsthand, including traveling across the universe. Given the phenomenon of time dilation, extraterrestrial visitors could actually be billions of years old without adjusting for the time dilation factor. Talk about ancient aliens. Nozomi Momoi. Nozomi Momoi was a Japanese blue movie actress whose death in 2002 shocked the industry and her fans. And yes, in case you're wondering, blue movie is a YouTube friendly term for a certain type of film and it does mean what you think it does. Born in Tokyo in 1978, Momoi entered the film scene in the late 1990s, gaining popularity for her abilities. Nozomi was a certified rising star when she met a tragic end in Nagano Prefecture on October 12, 2002. Her body was found in a burnt-out vehicle with a male friend. The situation was initially suspected to be a pact between Nozomi and her friend, with the theory suggesting that her companion ended Nozomi before consensually ending himself by setting himself on fire inside the car. In a significant development in October 2006, a civil court in Nagano ruled that the deaths of Nozomi and her companion were the result of a slaying by an unidentified third party. Despite this ruling, there has been no further advancement in solving the criminal aspect of the case. A number of theories have emerged over the years. Some speculate about potential involvement from the Yakuza, given the film industry's rumored connections to such entities in Japan. Another theory suggests the potential involvement of a deranged fan. However, at this point, all theories remain speculative. The Loch Ness Monster The Loch Ness Monster, often referred to as Nessie, is a cryptid said to inhabit Loch Ness, a large freshwater lake in the Scottish Highlands. Reports of sightings allegedly date back millennia, with accounts describing a large serpentine creature resembling a plesiosaur or other prehistoric marine reptile. The earliest known account of a creature resembling the Loch Ness Monster dates back to the 6th century. According to legend, in 565 AD, the Irish monk St. Columba encountered the creature while on a mission in Scotland. The creature reportedly attacked a man swimming in the river, but Columba intervened, invoking the name of God to banish the creature, which then retreated into the depths. This account, found in the biography of St. Columba, written around the time of St. Columba's life, is often cited as one of the earliest references to a mysterious creature inhabiting Loch Ness. That said, accounts of saints engaging in combat with beasts, nature, or representatives of evil are extremely common and are generally not taken to be historically valid accounts. In the 19th century, reports of unusual creatures in Loch Ness began to start appearing in the historical record. The first modern sighting of Nessie occurred in 1933, when a couple claimed to have seen a large creature resembling a dragon or prehistoric animal crossing the road near the lake. This sighting sparked a massive increase in Nessie claims throughout the 1930s. The surgeon's photograph, taken in 1934 by Robert Kenneth Wilson, purportedly shows the head and neck of the Loch Ness Monster emerging from the water. This iconic image became one of the most famous pieces of evidence supporting the existence of Nessie and has led to the enduring image of the cryptid. However, in 1994, the original, uncropped version of the photograph was discovered, and it was revealed that the photograph was a hoax, with Nessie, 
being a device constructed with a toy submarine. Efforts to search for Nessie have included sonar surveys of the loch, underwater cameras, and even satellite imagery, but conclusive evidence of the creature's existence remains elusive. Skeptics argue that the Loch Ness Monster is simply a myth or legend perpetuated by folklore and hoaxes, while believers maintain that there is still much to learn about the mysteries of Loch Ness. At present, there are basically three schools of thought on the Loch Ness Monster. One theory suggests that Nessie is a surviving population of plesiosaurs, a group of marine dinosaurs. Proponents of this theory argue that Loch Ness provides a suitable habitat for these creatures, with its deep cold waters resembling the environments where plesiosaurs thrived millions of years ago. Misidentifications. Another theory proposes that sightings of Nessie are simply misidentifications of known animals, such as large fish, seals, or floating debris. Loch Ness is also home to a variety of wildlife, including eels and sturgeons, which could be mistaken for a mysterious creature in the water. A combination of folklore and hoaxes. Some skeptics argue that Nessie is purely a product of folklore and hoaxes. They contend that stories of a monster in Loch Ness have been embellished over time, fueled by imagination, sensationalism, and occasional hoaxes such as the surgeon's photograph. At any rate, I love the Loch Ness Monster and Loch Ness Monster lore. And while my rational side accepts that these sorts of creatures don't live in Scottish lakes, I have more than a touch of romanticism in my heart so I will always hold out faint hope for Nessie. American Ghost Camels Ghost camels are part of American folklore, particularly in Arizona. The legend stems from the 19th century when the U.S. Army imported camels for transportation. After the experiment was deemed a failure, these camels were released into the wild leading to numerous sightings of feral camels roaming the deserts. The most intriguing aspect of these sightings is the tale of the Red Ghost. Accounts describe a large, red-haired camel wandering the desert, often with stories of a skeletal figure strapped to its back. The first reported sighting occurred in the 1880s, with a rancher encountering the Red Ghost, causing panic among his livestock. Another report details a woman found trampled by a large animal with mysterious red hairs left at the scene. That red hair is clearly evidence of a camel-based crime in my view. Over the years, sightings of the ghost camels continued, fueling speculation and the myth. Based on my research, it doesn't appear there's any evidence to suggest any sustained population of camels in Arizona. Interestingly, I don't see why camels couldn't have been more useful in the Southwest in the early days of American settlement, but their niche was taken very famously by horses. The Poe Toaster The Poe Toaster is a mysterious figure associated with an annual tribute to Edgar Allan Poe, the famous writer known for his mystery tales. This individual, whose identity remains unknown, visited Poe's grave in Baltimore, Maryland, every year on the writer's birthday, January 19th, from at least the 1930s until 2009. The tradition involved the toaster, leaving three roses and a half-empty bottle of cognac at the grave. The specifics of the ritual, such as the arrangement of roses and the choice of cognac, were consistent, adding to the intrigue surrounding the toaster's visits. The motivations behind the Poe Toaster's tribute are speculative, as the individual never publicly disclosed their reasons. Several theories suggest the act could be a gesture of admiration for Poe's work, a personal tribute from someone who felt a deep connection to the author, or part of a tradition passed down through a family or organization. The consistent nature of the tribute indicates a profound respect for Poe, highlighting his impact on literature and the lasting fascination with his dark, romantic, and enigmatic themes. 
Attempts to uncover the identity of the Poe toaster have been numerous but unsuccessful. Witnesses reported seeing a figure dressed in black with a silver-tipped cane, but efforts to follow or engage the individual never yielded concrete information. The toaster's ability to maintain anonymity, despite the public's interest and media attention, adds to the mystery and allure of the tradition. The cessation of the visits in 2010 led to speculation about the reasons behind the toaster's disappearance. Some believe the original toaster may have passed away, with successors attempting to continue the tradition without the original's commitment or secrecy. The Poe toaster phenomenon is bolstered by the fact that Edgar Allan Poe met his demise under mysterious circumstances, which were discussed in part two of this iceberg series. The Mothman. The Mothman is a cryptid first reported in 1966 in Point Pleasant, West Virginia. Descriptions depict it as a large winged humanoid with glowing red eyes. The phenomenon gained widespread attention following a series of sightings over a year, culminating in the tragic collapse of the Silver Bridge, which led to speculation about the Mothman being an omen of impending disaster. Initial sightings occurred near a former World War II munitions site, with two couples reporting an encounter with a large flying man with 10-foot wings chasing their car. Following these reports, more individuals came forward with similar accounts, describing a creature capable of incredible speed and eerie red eyes. The Mothman quickly became a fixture of local lore. The collapse of the Silver Bridge was a catastrophic event that occurred on December 15, 1967, in Point Pleasant, West Virginia, tragically resulting in the deaths of 46 people. The bridge, which spanned the Ohio River and connected Point Pleasant, West Virginia, to Gallipolis, Ohio, failed during rush hour, plunging vehicles and pedestrians into the icy waters below. An investigation into the disaster identified the cause of the collapse as the failure of a single bar in a suspension chain. This defect led to a crack that propagated under the stress of continuous use. Locals quickly theorized that there may have been some connection between this tragic event and the numerous sightings of the Mothman over the previous years. Theories regarding the Mothman's nature and origins vary widely. Some propose it is a previously undiscovered species, perhaps a giant owl, misidentified under stress or low-light conditions. Another theory suggests the Mothman is a paranormal entity, linking it to a wide range of supernatural phenomena including UFO sightings and encounters with men in black, who are said to warn individuals against speaking about UFOs. This theory is bolstered by the concentration of strange occurrences in the Point Pleasant area during the time of the Mothman sightings, including reports of poltergeist activity, unexplained lights, and electronic interference. Cryptozoologists and enthusiasts have also suggested that the Mothman might be an interdimensional being capable of moving between realities or dimensions. These days, the Mothman has become a symbol of Point Pleasant, with an annual festival celebrating this creature. My thoughts on the Mothman are that it's a likely owl misidentification. Owls are surprisingly large and terrifying, and the air of fear surrounding the Mothman likely led to heightened susceptibility to misidentifying a large, angry owl at night. Fuhrer Teutonicus Fuhrer Teutonicus, translated as Teutonic Fury, refers to the ancient Roman perspective of the Germanic people's manner of warfare. This concept encapsulates the Romans' view of the Germanic fighters as embodying a wild, frenzied style of combat, characterized by sheer ferocity and bravery. Historical accounts, notably by Roman historians such as Tacitus, described the Germanic tribes as rushing into battle with a berserk-like rage, an image that contrasted with the disciplined formations of Roman legions. Theories surrounding the phenomenon suggest it was partly a psychological tactic, instilling fear in enemies through the displays of apparently uncontrollable aggression. 
Modern interpretations question the extent to which Furor Teutonicus was exaggerated by Roman writers, proposing it as a form of propaganda to underscore the barbaric nature of their adversaries compared to Roman civilization. Conversely, archaeological findings and historical records indicate that Germanic warfare did involve elements of surprise, speed, and individual prowess. Alternative theories suggest that writers such as Tacitus inflated the bravery of the Germanic tribesmen as a way to shame Romans into better behavior. Notably, this concept has also been associated with other Germanic groups, such as the Vikings, a Germanic Norse group who needs no introduction, and the Normans, a Viking offshoot people. The Berserkers. Viking berserkers were fearsome warriors said to fight in a trance-like fury. These fighters, often linked to Odin, arguably the foremost of the Norse gods, supposedly possessed the ability to enter a battle-induced frenzy, making them formidable opponents who felt no pain and displayed extraordinary strength. The term berserker itself likely derives from an old Norse term meaning bear shirt indicative of their practice of wearing animal skins, particularly those of bears. These bear skins were believed to imbue them with bear spirit and bear strength during combat. Historical accounts and sagas describe berserkers as both awe-inspiring and terrifying, capable of feats beyond normal human abilities. They were reputed to bite their shields, howl like wild beasts, and cut through enemy ranks with unstoppable force. They were also reputed to be nearly impervious to pain. Their reputation alone was said to strike fear into the heart of their enemies. The unsolved mystery comes from how they were able to enter these states. Theories about the berserker's trance state range from psychological to physiological explanations, including ritualistic use of hallucinogenic substances to induce frenzy, Others suggest that the berserker rage was a form of hyper-arousal state, with the intense stress of combat triggering a flood of adrenaline and endorphins, resulting in heightened aggression and reduced sensitivity to pain. Another popular theory is that berserkers were bear cultists, and they didn't just believe the skins imbued them with the powers associated with bears, but rather that they believed they had physically become bears on the battlefield. The slaying of Otzi, the Iceman. Otzi, also known as the Iceman, was a Copper Age individual discovered in 1991, preserved within a glacier in the Alps, on the border between Austria and Italy. Otzi also happens to be the oldest cold case file around. Sorry, I couldn't resist the wordplay. Radiocarbon dating suggests he lived around 3300 BC. The state of his preservation has provided unprecedented insights into the life and death of people from the Copper Age. Otzi's demise has been the subject of extensive scientific investigation and speculation, leading to several theories about how and why he was killed. The primary evidence of Otzi's cause of death is an arrowhead lodged in his left shoulder, indicating he was shot from behind at a distance. This wound severed a major blood vessel, likely causing him to perish. Additionally, a deep cut on his right hand suggests he was involved in hand-to-hand -hand combat shortly before his death. These injuries, combined with other bruises and cuts found on his body, suggest that Otzi was involved in a violent conflict. One theory proposes that Otzi was a victim of a ritual sacrifice a practice known in various ancient cultures. However, the nature of his injuries and the location where he was found make this theory less plausible. It is more widely believed that Otzi died as a result of a conflict, possibly a skirmish or a personal dispute. Another theory suggests that Otzi was fleeing from his attackers when he was shot. The location and angle of the arrow injury support this theory as does the fact that his belongings were scattered around him as if he had been in a hurry. The evidence of a meal found in his stomach, consisting of grains and meats, indicates that Otzi had eaten very shortly before his death, 
suggesting he was taken by surprise. At this point, I think it's safe to say that the perpetrator has gotten away with it. Genghis Khan's Tomb The final resting place of Genghis Khan, the founder of the Mongol Empire, and one of history's most formidable conquerors, remains unknown. Despite extensive historical records of his conquests and the empire he built, details about the location of his tomb are conspicuously absent. One prevalent theory suggests that Genghis Khan's burial site is in the Mongolian Kenti Mountains, near the Onan River, an area considered sacred by the Mongols and closely associated with his early life. Another theory posits that the funeral procession took extraordinary measures to conceal the tomb's location, including killing those who attended the burial and diverting a river to cover the grave. Modern searches for Genghis Khan's tomb have employed satellite imagery, ground-penetrating radar, and other advanced technologies, but these efforts have been hampered by the Mongolian government's restrictions on excavations in certain areas. Additionally, some scholars argue that the tomb may never be found due to the nomadic lifestyle of the Mongols, which favored simpler, unmarked burial practices. Plus, the possibility that subsequent natural and human activities have obliterated any trace of the tomb over the centuries. If you've reached this point, don't forget to give my channel a like, and remember to subscribe, and ring the notification bell. I'm always in the kitchen cooking up fresh content for your enjoyment. Check out the Discord link in the description to chill with myself and other cool cats. Also, if you really want to take it up a level, consider becoming a part of my Patreon or joining the Lazy Chill Zone YouTube Membership Club. Click the links in the description. Shout out to my patrons Noah Schubert, Kazak Cutie, and Kurt the Squirt. Until next time, stay healthy and peace out.